I came away from this school in St Albans and I cried because I was so upset that I was met with utter blankness by these students. So they were kind of in a school on a housing estate, and, you know, they were they were in a bog standard school. And I try, you know, I told up my, my career is full of failure, not got qualifications, worked my way up, you know, my, my I do not have a, a, a glittering career story. So I told them about that. It wasn't cutting any eyes. And I said, so my, my path was accidentally to work my way up from the bottom and find out what I was good at and lucked out. But I always knew what I was interested in because I read and I thought and I noticed people and I said, what are you interested in? There was a combination of blankness and hostility, like it was an insult to them to ask them. And I just found it profoundly upsetting. Because I thought, you know, yes, some people like Maya Angelou do have true, true, true charisma. But most of it's manufactured. Most people, we're all the same. You know, we're all the same. It's about being animated, about being moved, about being educated. It's about being interested. And how awful that culturally we're just disconnected back to this sense. And I think when you are disconnected, and you work at scale and you don't connect intimately with what's real and what's possible, you make mistakes, you disconnect. So, you know, I'm pretty hard in the book on those social workers in Haringey, or particularly Sharon Shoesmith in Haringey. Not because I, I don't understand that she was illegally hounded out of her job and nobody should be illegally, you know, edged out, but because there's something wrong with the way we, we deify the idea of leadership and charisma at the expense of everybody who's part of shaping something. And in Haringey, when the Baby P scandal happened, I feel you had a whole raft of social workers who were so demoralized and brutalized and overworked and under-supported that they literally disconnected from reality, which is, and I stand by this, if you sent me to a house with a bulldog and a weird, crazy stepdad and a mother and rubbish on the house and I was met with a toddler and the mother said, oh, he's got chocolate on his mouth, I'm not sure I'd take that as read. I think I might think this child looks distressed. And I worry that what happens is if we are brutalized by being overloaded and overwhelmed and asked to operate at a scale that's not real. We disconnect and then you get really bad stuff happening, which is those social workers just abandoned that kid because they felt hopeless. And then that woman, you know, she went on woman's hour and talked about her leadership skills about two months later. And I sat in my car, pulled over, I gripped the steering wheel and I thought, no, this is horrendous that we've got a society like this, where someone actually defends something that happened on their watch and says, yeah, but I'm, I'm still a great leader. Yeah, so you're describing a situation where there's a, an institutional blindness that comes over people, and for lots of us, an individual blindness because we are so overloaded, and it's about his shoulders. the risk of the loss of humanity. Yeah, I mean... Concern. I'd love to sort of open it out, really. I mean, I, I, I hope I'm not being evangelical about change, but I think if we do all own what we're really about in our own individual lives and in the roles that we're playing, that's sort of where change happens. And it doesn't happen voting, particularly for the political party of choice, without getting active in the communities of those political parties. Uh, and it doesn't happen outsourcing our productivity to apps and technology. Look what happened at the NHS last weekend. Mm. I mean, that was just very interesting to me. In fact, I was at a mute, I, I won't say who I was with, but I was with somebody this morning who runs quite an important institution. 
And she said, well, of course, I was fine when our systems were hacked last year. She said, because I still do things face to face and operate on pen and paper. She said, but my entire staff froze because they, they just, you know, it isn't on the screen in front of them. They can't cope. Mm. So we've all got to go back to pen and paper now. So. <laughs> yeah. so fit. I think that's, that's the challenge, is how to stay anchored in what's real, which is you have finite time, finite headspace. I think this limitlessness is really a problem. Right, well, I want to open up to questions in a moment, but um, one thing you have done personally to claw back your humanity was to introduce this idea of Techno Shabbat, yes. um, <laughs> a, a weekly Techno Sabbath, 24 yes. hours, right? Mm -hmm. Difficult you... in the middle of a book tour, I have to say, right. where I become rather sort yeah. of, you know. But when, yeah. what gave you the idea for that, and so, when, when did you start, and has anybody else taken it on? Yes, the whole sort of digital detox is a thing now. Um, and that's really what I'm saying is that, I mean, I hope I haven't disappointed anyone by talking more about these big societal ideas because I sort of feel I've got you at hello on the we're all overloaded and we need to manage our technology. But I mean, I'm very happy to talk about those personal strategies if people want them. But I think a lot of us in the last two to three years began to say, this is all a bit much. Um, and so, in exactly the same way that, I, so I, 10 years ago, I, I, I had a very bad um, illness. I got pneumonia and sepsis and nearly died. And I didn't really pay attention to myself when I was getting ill. Um, and so I got overwhelmed and drowned, you know, almost, almost literally. Um, in, in that illness. And so as I recovered, I thought, well, I've got a family and I've got a business and I need to keep the show on the road. How am I going to survive? And one of the things I realized was that the, um, you know, just like a person who was faced with endless, endless, endless food to eat, you know, I was just going to drown in that overload because you needed some limits. And so I thought about a pattern and a shape, and I thought, okay, I've learned with my food what works for me and what doesn't work for me, which is choosing endlessly every single day doesn't work for me. So, you know, that's quite why 5-2 works for some people. So whenever I have a meal, I'm not thinking, shall I have bread, shall I have pudding, shall I have salt, yeah, because I make certain choices actually in certain days of the week and then it, it's not five two, I won't bore you with the detail, but it's a, it's a thing that I just don't have to think about. So my cognitive energy is reduced, so that's good. Oh, the, sorry to interrupt, but this is a book that you recommended to me, Willpower. Tim, the Willpower no, book. No, well actually it's Tim Talks Ferriss, oh, the four hour, Tim okay. Ferriss four hour it's work week and Tim Ferriss four hour body is really fantastic. Yeah, setting personal rules yes. so you don't have to make so many decisions. So there was some fantastic neuroscience yeah. in California, of course, some techniques where they got a control group of people in front of a two way mirror and they said um, it's a taste test. Uh, you've got, I don't know, pickled onions and you've got freshly baked brownies. Don't cheat. Pickled onion people eat pickled onions, brownie people eat the brownies. And they didn't cheat. Uh, the brown, you know, the pickled onion people didn't run over to the brownie table. And obviously the brownie people didn't run over to the pickled onion table. All good. Then they took the same group at the same, you know, immediately afterwards and they said, right, we're just going to give you a little Rubik cube, a little, um, you know, insoluble puzzle. See how you get on. Well, they didn't say it was insoluble, but it was insoluble. They said, see how you get on. And they watched which group gave up first. Which group gave up first, brownies or pickled onions? Brownies. 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 Hands up brownies. Hands up pickled onions. Yeah. Okay. Well, the pickled onion people gave up first because they'd exerted they their willpower. I mustn't, I mustn't eat those brownies. I won't eat those brownies. God, I'm going to use more willpower to solve this effing problem. And that, really, I understood that. And what they concluded out of that kind of research was that if you, if you reduce resistance and reduce the requirement to extend energy and willpower, then you're going to, in fact, find it easier. So basically, they conclude 
always have your gym bag packed, which I now always do. You know, so Techno Shabbat came out of that kind of thinking, which is in fact rules and limitations in this limitless world are quite helpful. And at the same time, I became not born again Jew, but sort of Jewish, more Jewish than I've been, which is um, family and ritual and Friday night supper. So I thought, what if I used that Friday night hook? And it was just about the time my kids were becoming teenagers, some of them anyway, and I thought, you know, I don't want to lose the thread and thing. So what if we make Friday night a big deal meal? And what if I then turned off technology and and it it kind of works. I mean, I'm so addicted the rest of the time, you could blink and miss it, you know, my family. And if you ask if you you know, if you daily mailed my family about it, they might go, well, oh, she's on all the bloody time. But, but, but I'm not. You know, on a good Friday, I've cleared down the inbox, I've laid a linen tablecloth, I've got the candle skits out. You know, I really, I sort of do what Orthodox Jews used to do, Jewish women still do, but you know, you clean, sort of clean the house, you clean and get ready and and usher in a new phase. And I found that really helpful, actually, surprisingly helpful. I do think we need to move into different zones. Now we rest, now we pay attention. And I think, again, it comes back to this sense of the knowledge, networks, and time. We've got to, got to have a structure or we will just not get it right. Mm. Quite anal, actually, and quite a management geek, really. Quite like rules. Mm. It's a great tip. Right, well let's open up. Um, please do feel free to ask anything you like or give us tips as well. Or me, you don't need them. I or need disagree. Tips. Yeah, let's all disagree. Yeah. Woman in the beautiful shirt. Yes. It's quite a digital kind of pixel yeah. shirt. <laughs> um, I just um, thought I'd ask, um, do you think Donald Trump is suffering from overload in terms of not being able to fix, stop, not being able to um, stop thinking about, about the media and what they're saying about him? It's a really interesting question. There is a whole sort of bit in the book about, um, about the media and about um, the fact that I think one of, the, one of the consequences of this age of overload is, is fake news, is the fact that our ability to trust and believe and, and filter news is very compromised. And I think it didn't start with Donald Trump. In fact, 10 years ago, an American comedian called Stephen Colbert coined the phrase truthiness. So I definitely think that Donald Trump is a product of the age of overload, both from sort of horrible, horrible reality TV and that culture that's been, you know, venerated by just as many Democrats as Republicans probably, but they created a monster. Um, I think I think you're you're are you really asking that? I mean, or are you asking, is Donald Trump an utter? I mean, <laughs> um, I think it's just, it just occurred to me while listening, um, you know, it, that it sounds like a classic case, you know, it, just that that is always a bait for to hear people yeah. really sort of see, oh, what are they thinking about me? I certainly think he's the first global politician to continually, continually communicate by by broadcast, sort of effectively live streaming through the live tweeting. And I think that, you know, the, the sources of information we take in or put out, if they're only tweets and if they're only short form and if they're, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad diet, it's a bad mix. So I do have that, you know, that little thing I call the knowledge dashboard at the back, you know, like the five a day campaign which was a construct but sort of works, that we need five fruit and veg a day. I mean, we probably need 50 fruit and veg a day or 17 a day. It's a, it's a number that was plucked out of the air. But it's quite a good way of saying, if I spend every day only eating bread or only eating carb, whatever, that's not going to be good. I think Donald Trump lives in a very, very, from what I gather, a very, very short attention span, sound bite, go for the jugular kind of mode, which, you know, 
does he write op-ed pieces? Is he capable of writing a reasoned argument? Or, or you know, having a ghostwriter do that for him? No, probably. And that is a worry, definitely. Yeah, I think he's ended up being very bad PR for those forms of communication. Yeah. And I think the way that he uses Twitter has made a lot of other people think, am I starting to get a bit like that? Better stop. I wonder, I mean, you know, you do. It, it is going to be interesting when all this is over, whether it's over in four years or eight years or in eight days if he's impeached. But, you know, I wonder whether whether that office of presidency, back to your point about charisma and... I think we're moving to a world when we want to continue to look up to people because that's very human, but where we also want equality. And I think, unfortunately, that's where he hits the the money shot is he does speak for people who don't feel they have a voice and he is not speaking for those of us that sort of expect our politicians to behave like grown up politicians he just doesn't do that and that I think is I don't know whether it'll you know the royal family couldn't do that the royal family is only a, you know dad dancing was too much wasn't it when Prince William was caught doing that you know, they want to be seen to be accessible, but also remote, also, because that's what we, we in Britain anyway want. It's going to be amazing when he comes over, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cultural <laughs> car crash, <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, great. Go ahead. Hello. Um, Hi, Jane. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask um, about collaboration and connection. Um, do you think that sometimes when people are from different parts of the world, when they want to connect, cultural differences can get in the way of connection and collaboration. And my second question is, um, should there be anything such as a global etiquette? Well, one of the banks ran that very good campaign, I think it was HSBC, about different norms and customs and calling out the fact that, you know, I mean, in Japan, the business card is an is a, is a, you know, is a, is a act of great grace and you know, whereas for some people it's the height of vulgarity in other cultures, for instance. Um, so yes, cultural differences do matter and do happen. Um, but I think in the end, whether it's whether you dice and slice it intergenerationally or cross racially or cross class or cross culture, you know all humans are more alike than they are unalike. I mean, I do believe that. I don't have any anthropological evidence to the contrary. So I think that what matters is how we allow those differences to be voiced. And just going back to the network science, you know, my little um, curating of, of, of some of this stuff, the network science shows unequivocally both that thing I said earlier about the structure of networks is quite similar and therefore what matters is the behaviour on them that is the differentiator rather than the structure of them, which is generally speaking relatively fixed. But the other big, big thing from network science uh, is that diversity in networks, um, if you want healthy flow of ideas, uh, is is better. So, you know, the group think and the closed network structure of subprime mortgage traders, um, funnily enough, fully connected in topological terms, is in fact a closed network. It's a, it, it sort of everything leads back to itself. Um, what you want is, in a room, someone being able to put their hand up and go, mm, I, I don't know, I don't think I agree with the group. And for that to be okay, not in a politically correct way, oh, you're disagreeing with us, how annoying, but we won't say, but more like, are you saying something we haven't thought of? You know, the referendum, I thought, was a really interesting example in how democracy is, in fact, more diverse than a lot of politicians would like it to be. And there were different diverse views being expressed that people just didn't want to air. And for whatever reason, they were aired by an kind of accident of, you know, David Cameron and whatever. 
but in a funny kind of a way, at least society is having certain discussions. It's also got bad byproducts. You do air those cultural differences and you see those differences and those differences can become painful. What do you think? I think it's a tricky question because I had... I'm glad you say that. I thought it was a tricky question. <laughs> I, 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 I kind of had this discussion with someone from America about uh, whether you should answer emails from people who want something in particular from you when you're overwhelmed or when you're very busy. And I was just saying that Oh, right, those kind of cultural differences. Yes, that's where... Okay, was. sorry, I was giving you the great big... <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's okay. But essentially, I just thought that in the approach of that American person, it was more about, I don't have time, I'll ignore it. And I was just saying that I don't think it's very caring and very nice to do it like that. Even if you oh, don't Americans have time, can be brutal. Just say, <laughs> they I don't have brutal. time. I know what you mean. <laughs> and yeah. just be direct about it. And it was just kind of a clash yeah. about... Well, Americans... I love Americans, great business thinkers, I love Americans, but when it comes to networks and networking, they and I would say they alone have given it a terrible name because uh, it's been entirely created as a transactional sales based, brand based, you know, show your charisma, show your presence. It's not what networking is. Networking is curiosity, networking is humility, networking is listening, networking is random. Networking is you speak to the person on the plane or the train next to you because why wouldn't you? And you <coughs> might learn something or you might feel something or you might observe something without a purpose, without an end game. The Americans are forensically ruthless mm -hmm. about... Come on. Is it, you know... I mean, all those wonderful phrases, you snooze, you lose. Has anyone ever seen Glenn Gary get Glenn Ross? You know, it's a fantastic example of just how venal when you get down to it, people can be. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, this lady here. Um, I, I thought that you were saying at some one point that um, there's a lack of meaning in, in, in life, which it seems to be something that people complain of, is to do with the overload. But I was just wondering whether whether it sort of works slightly the other way around, whether the lack of meaning has created this situation in which we have the overload, and whether there's an underlying something. It's a really good is, point. Is, that is a very anarchic <laughs> kind of point. It's very no, dark. It's, yeah, it's a very good point. point. I like it. It's a very good point. I'm not sure I framed it. I mean, I think you're right. So I've written quite a lot in here about you know, the cultural psychology of, say, Instagram, you know, the narcissism. I really did see a young woman on the street yesterday, and it was a busy street, and she, I'm going to stand up and do this, and she, this is the phone, this is the mobile phone, and she was in the middle of the road, right? And she went like this, and, like this, and, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> I um uh I did that thing you should all do if you're interested, which is at the very, very last minute you go up to the gate and you say have you got any special offers and they give you a good price and you can turn left on the plane at like five minutes to push on. So I turned left on the plane and I was getting into my flatbed and there was a woman next to me and she was obviously an actress or somebody and she was also the whole play journey. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm doing a little selfie thing. And I thought, goodness me, this is like really a thing. I mean, more of a thing. And I'm a prolific sharer and oversharer on social media. And I think, I think that there is an argument, especially when you talk about internet dating, which I do in the book, that we are craving meaning and intimacy precisely because we don't have it and we think that the answer is going to be in the number of friends and the number of social media. But just to push back, as the Americans might say, on your point, I'm not saying that we don't have meaning because of the age of overload. I'm saying that the way society continues to be structured in silos of hierarchy and valuing people according to their job title or their worth uh, 
disconnects people from what gives them meaning, which is their relationships. So another piece of neuroscience, which I cite a lot in the book, um, a really, really interesting guy called Matthew Lieberman, who's written a book called Social, and he did research, like actually photographing people's brains or doing whatever they do, you know, lab research. And the default position of the human brain, every healthy, functional, non-psychopathic, non-injured brain, a bit like the 168 hours in a week, is identical in this respect, which is when it's not concerned with picking up a book or something, what is all of our resting state brain continually concerned with? Who we love and who loves us. That's it. And when you see things like, you know, those almost unbearable, you know, the 9-11 planes and things, that's what they did before they, you know, they phoned, I love you, I love you, I love you, that's all it was. And that's what I'm saying is that, we know that, that's, that's the truth, but we don't follow that in our everyday lives. And I don't want to sound like some hippy dippy, you know, holistic yoga mat person, but that's sort of what I feel is part of the problem. So we're, we're, we're living a very complicated life rather than just, do I feel good? Do I feel secure? Yes. Thank you. Um, you. Yeah, you talked a lot about time scales and you said 25 years, so that's 9,125 days since quote unquote the World Wide Web. Well, I somebody's think. been secretly using that. Well, calculated it's very smart. Um, it's, uh, yeah. but, but, no, but so the point is, the, well, the question is, you know, Gutenberg, what, 1450, the printing press, we've had quite a lot of time to adjust to having, you know, books around us. To what extent is is the feeling that we're overwhelmed and we can't cope and we're looking for mechanisms to deal with it all, an artifact of, of the fact that it is only 9,000 days since we've had this stuff around us. Uh, very and for many of us, less. You know, I mean, that 1995 and Windows is kind of, Windows 95, I kind of think, is usually a better start point because that's when most people got in there and mobile peaked in, really took off in 98 in the UK. So what, to what extent is, are we just actually just going to get over this? Or, or is there something fundamentally very different about the world that you're talking about, the connected technologies you're talking about, which is actually much more difficult for us to, to comprehend, to adapt to, to kind of work out how we deal with it? Well, I think it's different, but I'm, I'm basically fundamentally optimistic as long as we don't sort of throw away our key asset, which is ourselves. I mean, I think the real danger is not the amount of technology, because I think there are an incredible number of advances which, you know, we want to need in, in, in our lives, but that we, we, um, we let our faculties and our abilities to solve problems in groups and to be intimate and to be connected and to be face-to-face -face and to get things done manually as well as at scale, that we let those atrophy and wither because we think everything can be done by, you know, a hub and spoke connected mass scale technology. And I think that would be a huge mistake because the reason why I open the book with the story of the Ebola crisis is that, it, it first of all, it's a really interesting illustration, I think, of all of these different network failures um, and successes, if you like, you know. Um, uh, that, you know, the politicians in West Africa were so freaked out that they made this mad decision to only count the people that were obviously dying of Ebola rather than the people that had been exposed to it, which meant they kept the borders open, which meant people just walked all over the borders and, and, and sort of doubly connected. And at the same time, um, in the end, the only thing that stopped it and arguably I would say it was a woman, the first, uh, the only 
woman president of an African nation, the president of Liberia, Eileen Sirleaf Johnson, she imposed a quarantine. She shut down the network. She limited the network effect of the scale-free network that was spreading. Um, and so, you know, the human does adapt. The human does cope. I'm not saying it's fundamentally different in the sense that I think the human is threatened, but I do think that we are um, more surrounded than ever, and therefore we have to make more informed choices because the world is more connected in good and bad ways, whether it's epidemics spreading or transport systems or, or, you know, networks. And so I think we've not begun to look at what I call, basically, you asked me a bit earlier on, you know, what's what's the new discipline? And I call it only once. Um, I call it behavioral networks. It's kind of what I think it, what I think it is. Um, but, but you raise an interesting point, which is a bit like, are more children being abducted and having horrible things done to them, or are we just aware of more of them because of the reporting? You know, some of these challenges, and it is a criticism of my work, is that, well, maybe I'm just sort of bigging it up as a problem. You know, come on, we've always had problems of scale and speed and industrialization. Maybe it's not that new. I think it is new, but I'm optimistic that we can overcome it. But I should probably just say that the other sort of context of this is not um, 25 years ago, but 70 years ago. So 70 years ago, when the world was at a similarly pivotal moment, arguably, the end of the Second World War, all those new post-war institutions that are now clearly under stress and duress, like the UN, where I'm going to go and talk about this book next month, 70 years ago, the World Health Organization was formed to improve physical, mental, and social well-being. The definition hasn't changed. And all I'm saying is that we know that physical and mental health needs to be dealt with for impact on all of us in our individual lives and our collective lives. But that concept of social well-being which 70 years ago sort of meant class determining nutrition levels, therefore determining fitness to fight, has changed, and therefore we have to engage with that change. Otherwise, it's obviously an oversight, isn't it? Okay, thank you. Um, we're coming to the last five minutes, but I think we can squeeze in at least one more question, maybe two. Do you think this is going to radically change what we do in schools? I wish that it were. I mean, it kind of goes back to my speakers for schools thing. I mean, some of connected technology presents some of the most amazing opportunities um, in developing countries. There's, there's no doubt about it. You know, these free and mud-proof, waterproof tablet technology. I mean, I can't get enough of that. You know, I think I absolutely think. Te connected technology is a very, very good way of educating mass numbers of people. I definitely think, and it's a bigger conversation, that a lot of this discontent and dysfunction that I'm talking about, which may or may not be overstated, is, <coughs> is absolutely evident in the education system. I mean, you know, very, very wonderful. Um, are, you know, I've suddenly forgotten his name, Kenneth, um, Ken. Richardson. Richardson. You know, uh, we kind of know that education is not geared appropriately to teach people how to be and how to learn and how to, we should be putting different generations in the same classroom, you know, we should be doing all sorts of different things around the concept of learning, I think. Um, so no, I don't, I, I, I think it's as much as anything economic challenge.